all, thanks so much for watching Making Healthcare Work for You, Different Perspectives and Empowering Solutions. I'm Stephanie Fields, joined by my co-host, Dr. Apoorv Gupta, and today we are welcomed by Dr. Payal Bunderi, who is the founder of SF Advanced Health. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. You are practicing medicine in a different way. You are really getting back to the root, searching for the causes, and getting to know the patients. In the pre-interview, you mentioned that in an average visit, people see their established patients for seven minutes and their new patients for 12, whereas you spend 60 with established patients and 90 minutes with your new patients. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your approach and why you founded your company? My approach and why I founded my company is because I love what I do. And I wanted to say it's true to why I chose to go into medicine. Um, and it's all about connection. So when we can connect with other human beings, we give each other the space to speak from our heart, um, from our mind, and from our spirit. And when I create that space, you can hear what people are saying. And that helps build trust. When you build trust, you gain more clarity of mind and clarity of mind drives change. So for me, it had to do with, I wanna keep loving what I do. If I'm gonna spend a big percentage of my day working, then I wanna love it. And I want people to love feeling that they have the opportunity to actually be empowered and to change the trajectory of where their health is going. And changing the trajectory has to change with changing your thoughts, your feelings, to change your attitude, to change where you're willing to invest your time, your energy, your money. So it's meeting people where they are. And for me, it was about, I was very burnt out. And I didn't like drinking the Kool-Aid that I was being told by the environment I was working in. I just didn't ethically want to do that. And so I took a chance and it's the chances worked. People like it. I like it. It works. And you said that 95% of the things that people visit for are preventable. And that's a pretty mind blowing statistic. So how is that? Because that's such an, a major shift from what people see. Because so many times, I mean, how many, you turn on the TV and almost everything you're going to see, it's going to be like fast food, some sort of tech, or a drug. <laughs> so how can people present prevent 95% of the things that we're seeing? That's truly incredible. It would fact impact basically everybody in the United States. <sighs> Well, I think one key piece is how we think about things. Um, you know, in the West, we believe that the past defines your present and your future. If you were to change that and say the future defines your present and the past is your past, take the best of it and leave the rest of it behind if you can't change it. When you can actually see a future of what you want to imagine and you take that and say, the present is my gift. You can change anything, right? At that moment, that shift, all of a sudden you're like, you breathe differently, right? Just because you're just like, no way. I could look like that. I could feel like that. I don't have to be afraid every single second of my life, subconsciously or consciously. All of a sudden, you will immediately see yourself free. And I think it's exactly that, is that in any moment in your life, your, your trajectory can change, right? You've personally experienced that, Stephanie. I've experienced that where that one minute I thought I was totally invincible and the next second I'm being told I have breast cancer and I'm about to be dead in three to six months. And I'm like, oh my God, which way do I want to go? Uh, and that's how everything in life really is that any second things can change. So let the future 
define your present versus your past defining the rest of your life. You don't have to be a chronic pathology. That can change. Wow. It's so impactful just letting your words come out there and sit with them. I think uh, what you're saying is, uh, in my view, it feels like it's paradigm changing in so many ways, not, not only for you and for your patients, but also for the health system. And I wonder what you're saying about the, the future. Maybe that's a helpful way to think about the healthcare system also. Uh, if we were to think about the healthcare system itself as so diseased and dysfunctional and so broken, and so many of us as are experiencing, you've experienced, Stephanie's talked about her experiences. Is the paradigm you're talking about also applicable to the healthcare system, you think? Is, is it possible for enough of us who are working within and, and without the system to start thinking differently about what we want it to be so that we can re-envision a future healthcare system that isn't contingent on the past? Yeah. I mean, consumers drive change, right? When they're like, I don't like this and this is really making me upset. Why do I have to do this? And consumers are changing. I mean, people who are in their thirties, twenties, they are making very different choices and they don't put up with this kind of nonsense where they say, what do you mean? I don't know how much something's going to cost. What do you mean? I have to sign up for something. And then Later on, you give me a bill of like $10,000 and this isn't working. Consumers are driving change. And that is the way it works is that the people in institutions will not make the change. They have no incentive to change. You know, it's like empires where why would the rulers want to change like the way things have worked? They have no incentive. The same thing goes for healthcare system. It's like a big empire. And the people who are controlling it, are they really incentivized to have you never go into the hospital, never use like very expensive modalities? They're not. You know, like, for example, it's you can charge a minimum of five thousand dollars a day to be in a hospital. If you got more complications, you're jacking it up to ten thousand. Now, why wouldn't a hospital administrator and the people who are making money, why would they want to change that? Like. It's a for-profit industry. And yes, you can say, I want to keep you well. I want to do this. But the reality is, let's look at the structure. If you're paying more out of your own pocket, um, where you're like, oh, my God, the cost itself is going to give you a heart attack. You start thinking, wait, 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 wait. I have to take responsibility. I think that's the other element is we live in a country um, and even globally where there's wealth. There's about, you don't need to change anything. When you get sick, don't worry about it. We'll fix you. So when you start saying, oh, shoot, this is costing me money. You start changing like, no, no, you know what? I think maybe I'm going to pick changing what I put on my plate and what I'm serving my kids. And maybe I don't like the way it makes me feel. And it's not just based on the future. It's based on, I feel terrible when I do this. It makes me feel scarcity. So I think consumers they they want and they are making the change. And I think it's about the system is breaking. It's been breaking. But that's part of the way disruptors, you know, they come about and they gain popularity because there's a reason that consumers are saying, I really love this. And every time I engage with it, I feel even better than what I expected. So the bar of expectation goes up higher. And when your bar is getting higher, and then when you go into a, a hospital, which looks like a really fancy hotel, but it don't feel like you're at the Ritz Carlton and people like don't even look at you and like connect with you. And there's all these barriers. They're like, I'll only go there if I have to go there, but what could I do? So I do think that when your bar goes up higher and you're looking at the difference and it's a lot lower in quality, things change. Again, change takes time, but I'm a huge believer in like, I want to feel good. And we all as human beings do what feels good. Um, and fear doesn't last, doesn't change us for that long. It's pretty short lived, right? We go right back to what we've always done. So I think that it's happening. 
Um, I love that it's happening. I think that it's been needed for a long time. Uh, and the people who got the money are changing how things are done. It's in, it's interesting what you're saying there, Pyle, because clearly I do agree with you that uh, consumers are really driving uh, uh, change to some extent, but they have to have a different paradigm that's available to them. Uh, and many of them don't even know that such a paradigm is available. So they're stuck in the system because we've been we've had this system for so many years. And here comes someone like you and is offering a completely different way of thinking about your health and thinking about the healthcare, thinking about the way you live. So, uh, you know, I guess uh, to me, the question is, how did you step out? I mean, I know you said you were feeling burnt out. You went through your own health issues. But how did you take that bold, courageous step? and get out of the system, so to speak, and decide that it was time to reimagine this, you know, at that time, did you realize that consumers were demanding something different? Is that still what was pulling you forward? Or did you have to ultimately move forward with your own vision of what you thought healthcare should be, and, and then realize that the consumers were also looking for that? Maybe you can tease that out a little bit for us. As much as I didn't like a lot of the things of being in a traditional family practice that's insurance based, I didn't have a choice. Um, it's very it was economically driven um, in the sense that I was getting paid less to work a lot more hours, and I had less and less autonomy. And when I was voicing concerns about fundamental issues that were happening on the patient side and on my side. The administrators were like, I don't care. And so when I'm constantly trying to make it work any which way possible, and I'm like looking at the situation saying, I'm getting paid less money. I get less time with my family. And now I have to like beg to have a bathroom break, you know, forget about eating because it's just not part of the structure. That's when I like knew I had no choice. I had to get out because I also knew that you know, you only have so much money to keep continuing these systems and the system is broken. And in in that, I saw that the system I was in, when the money was going to run out, they were going to close the shop. And I didn't want to be going supporting that because what, what was I going to be left with? I'd be even sicker, right? So at that moment, I didn't have the luxury to just say, okay, can I research and figure out what I'm going to do? I'm basically like stuck with like, shoot, I have a choice. I'm either going to leave medicine completely or I'm going to figure out what to do. And so at that point, I just had to make some strategic decisions about no insurance. I know what that works like. I've been in the industry for almost a decade at that point. And this is getting, this is really bad. So the economics didn't make sense for me to support being the middleman for insurance because it meant that my hands were going to continue to be handcuffed and I was going to get paid less and less money to do more work, right? Because reimbursements every year are going down. So how was I going to make, how was I going to pay bills? And so I think that I just basically had to start all over after having a very busy, successful practice where I could allocate the time to spend with people and I could develop a financial model for the business that's very low overhead cost. Um, and then the, the goal is, is that you keep your overhead really low, but your over time, how much you make keeps going up and up, right? And so it is a practice that is built on people seeking you out, right? It was 90% was organically driven. I had to change, like not sitting behind a desk waiting for people to come in and not investing on the marketing side. I had to get out there and tell people, hey, I exist. And you start getting feedback from all kinds of professionals, all kinds of patients about what are they wanting? And by getting that feedback, I was able to continue to constantly customize like the product that I'm selling. And also, it's very critical to have a strong online presence because that's how people view, get their research, right? So I felt that you have to be a thought leader. I had to put a lot of energy out there to build the business, but it overall is a win-win because you're working hard no matter what. When I was in the insurance business, I was working my butt off 
but I was getting increasingly more unhappy. In the non-insurance model, I was also working my butt off, but I was driving better outcomes. I was a lot happier um, as a human being, as a mother, as a wife, as a doctor. And that matters because when you drive shifts in your existence, you drive better outcomes. People like being with you. And I meet people where they are, right? So all of a sudden, consumers are like, wow, I can text you. I can call you like in real time and we get things done. And every time they're getting better. And, and when I'm like, well, I'm not sure. Let's figure this out. It's a partnership. People are like, wow, this is such a different approach. They're like, this is so refreshing. And that's how that's how it works, right? So um, it's you can't go in assuming, oh, you're going to all of a sudden be successful. Business is business. It takes time to build a business. But the reality is, is that you're moving in the right direction and you have to build a strong foundation from the beginning. You can't just haphazardly, just chaotically like, Say, okay, I'm going to take all these insurances. I'm going to have a high volume based practice because you don't actually, nobody likes it. I mean, you're going to, when you get paid like 80 bucks for an hour with somebody, you're like $80. Like that's how much, that's how reimbursement works, right? For a primary care doctor. And so the economics just, the economics define what you're going to do. You've said that you were a better wife, a better doctor, a better mom because of all these things. So it sounds like you've been able to remove yourself from the system, but become more engaged with both your own personal life and the lives of your patients, allowing them to have better outcomes. So what has that looked like? You know, when you have a day now, you know, are you able to help these people who have been in the traditional system and may have been struggling with chronic conditions on medications and you're able to help them shift that to a situation where they can potentially even overcome that? A hundred percent. So part of it is yes, in you're a business owner, so you are on a lot. Um, but the thing what I realized even before I made that move was that in my eight years of practice, it wasn't my patients who were calling in the middle of the night and I was getting them admitted. Like I had, I didn't have that, right? I really focused on like, if you got whatever time you have, make it quality based versus quantity based. And you've got to really, t you zone in on your human communication skills and focus on like all the information that this person is conveying, not just by what they're saying, but their body, you know, so really become like very sharp at connecting with people. And so what I found was that like, yes, I'm technically on 24 seven, but because I could address majority of patients issues during the daytime hours, when we connected, they knew that I was also a a mother and a wife and that I'm not sitting in the office all day long. And I said, look, here's how you can message with me. And so they respected my time. And I was, you know, and whenever they email, I could give them so much value where we really were on top of things. So we never have to get to that major catastrophe all the time. Right. So I don't, re I never built a career where I have patients that I'm in the hospital and the ER all the time. I mean, those are important when they serve a purpose, but so much of it, if you can access your doctor way in advance, you can prevent it, right? And they respected me and I respected them. And so you're constantly able to meet people where they are. And when you can do that and you really like can do the work to be like, you know what, I'm not sure, let me go do some research. And they're like, oh, wow, like you really thought outside the box. That is our job is to, you know, we're if we're the expert, they're like, hey, can you think the parts that I can't figure out? Because many times patients are also outsourcing their thinking to me. And they're like, oh, that's medical. Can you help me figure this out? Well, I have to be able to figure it out. Um, but I have created time so I can figure it out. Kyle, I mean, you've painted a really incredible dramatic and uh, and uh, almost like a call to action for uh, others in the healthcare system to be thinking about how do we provide care, you know, in this different model. Uh, I, I guess before we wrap up, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't get to cover uh, maybe one or two stories of the kinds of things you're able to do with patients that is so different, you know, then how are you able to get to the root cause? How are you able to identify what could be prevented? 
Uh, if you could help lay that out, I think that would be very helpful. I'm gonna just present a case um, and to help you answer that question. So I had a patient who came in, she was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, which is one of the most common heart arrhythmias that are out there. And she had been seeing integrative cardiologists um, for a bit of time, but her issue was not getting addressed. So when she came to see me, what I did was I looked at her, all the labs that she'd been done. So a lot of basic labs that most doctors are prescribing or ordering. And what I found was that the cardiologist was just seeing it as in this is this arrhythmia and this is what we're going to do. But when I looked at all the labs, I said, wait a minute, like this doesn't make logical sense to me. In that case, I said, look at your kidney markers. They're consistently like abnormal and look at your liver markers. You have fatty liver disease. And I said, let's understand how do these organs function? I said, you can't just jump to an arrhythmia and not understand that the kidneys manage all the electrolytes, right? That you're not processing protein very effectively. You've got a fatty liver. That means that you also probably are not breaking down like saturated fats. And I said, if we don't address these issues that are long standing, and you've actually got like that's probably the root issue, right? That I got to start with. And I'm like, the, the numbers are there. It's not like I was the first person to see that. She had been seen by many doctors before. And I just looked at the trends and I said, why is these not being addressed? By seeing that the patient was like, wait a minute, it's not just my heart. And I'm not just going to keep focusing on heart attack and stroke. As I said, the drugs are not necessarily preventing you from getting it. You've already had a stroke on the formula that you've been given. So in that case, which is a lot like many other cases, I looked at the numbers, just the labs, and I was able to pick up all the things that were getting missed. And by picking that up, I said, okay, let's understand how do the kidneys work? Um, we put her on like a no animal protein diet because she couldn't break any of it down. We had her actually start investing in a more whole foods plant-based diet. Number two, it was really key to help her understand that she didn't breathe, right? In the sense that she was always scared. And as a human being, our reflexes, when we're concentrating intensely, we actually stop breathing. And then on the flip side, when we stop breathing, well, that's a problem. So we actually flip to shallow breathing. But in either case, what's happening is the heart is contracting a ton and it's not spending time relaxing. Blood oxygenation happens only during heart relaxation. So she is not effectively perfusing the organs below her diaphragm. That means that she doesn't break food down adequately. If I have her on a high dense molecule diet of saturated fats and a lot of intense complex carbohydrates, well, she can't break it down. So now her liver is clogged up, her gut's not working, her kidneys are not working, her adrenals are out of whack. That all being said, that by digging deeper, just looking at the science and saying, wait a minute, just this doesn't make logical sense. Why are you not changing what you're eating? And like, look how you're breathing. She was like, oh, so like by just doing that, all of a sudden this patient within a month, the arrhythmias were like no longer like every day. It went down to like, you know, once a month because she's still terrified of the trauma she did, you know, we got her started getting off of her, some of the drugs that she was on because she, her risk was going down, right? We monitored her labs closely. We were seeing that making those shifts was actually changing her kidney function or liver function. She was losing a lot of excess weight she was having. And so the numbers were supporting the lifestyle changes. She was clinically responding and we were closely monitoring things. And by doing that, the patient was also feeling more confident, right? I was feeling more confident to be like, yeah, this is working for you. And that is many cases where I use the science to help me understand, like, what's this person experiencing, you know, because her, a human being's interpretation of symptoms can mean a lot of different things. And if you only see it from the lens of your specialty, you assume that that symptom means A, B, C, D, E, but you don't actually see it from the whole body perspective. 
right? So my job has always been like, I got to know the kidneys and the liver and the stomach and the brain, like they're all important. And I can't just like pinpoint on, oh, you got this diagnosis. It must be right. My job is to say, well, if it is right, I got to make sure I didn't miss anything else. And even at that time, that's what we have. We need to be able to reverse this, right? So my attitude is like not attaching to what somebody else has said, but to constantly reassess and to know that cells change every 90 days. So if you can figure out how to have them not go into premature aging, but help regenerate cells, you can change the course. What is that message that you would just tell people who are maybe on the brink? They're the physicians who are in the field, like you were feeling like they're struggling, not making the impact they want. And the patients who feel like they're stuck in the system, just a diagnosis, they're just a lab report. What would you tell those people and how they can change their life? Inspire hope. Each of us is a change maker. If you wait for the world to change for you, you will stay in a place of scarcity and you will feed the fear and the fear will be your reality. If you can shift to abundance where you are truly grateful for what you do have present in your life, you can inspire hope. So not about hoping, I hope, but inspire hope. That is the start of change. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here and telling us about this. It was really enlightening to learn about the different ways and how you can tackle these things that are things that most people look at and think, okay, I'm now going to be on this medication forever, or I'm going to be in this rat race of, you know, the healthcare system. So thank you so much for sharing the alternate ideas. Definitely. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Pyle. Very inspiring and very hopeful. And I, I love your message. Uh, all the power to you. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay.